Um, we're in a series on 1 Corinthians, and so if you have a Bible, take it out, whether it's in app form or book form. If you need to grab one of the Bibles in front of you, feel free to do that. If you don't have a Bible, take that home with you. It'd be our gift, our joy to gift that to you. Um, but like I said, we're in this series on 1 Corinthians. We're in chapter 13. We began looking at chapter 13 last week when Dave came and walked us through the first three verses. Even if you haven't grown up in the church, aren't all that familiar with the Bible, you probably have heard somewhere, like Dave mentioned last week, especially if you've been to a few weddings over your, over your lifetime, 1 Corinthians 13 uh, being read. It's, it's iconic. I, I believe the Bible is fully inspired. Every curve, every dot is God's word, but there are certain passages, chapters that are precious to us, perhaps more precious to us because of what's contained in them. I don't mean to suggest, like I said, that there is some greater and some lesser, but there are just some texts that are really, really precious and special and have a a really significant place in our hearts and our minds. And 1 Corinthians 13 is certainly one of them. Just to remind you of last week, if, if you were here, I'll remind this, uh, this will be a reminder uh, to you, but if you weren't, just to let you know what Dave walked us through last week, I could basically wrap it up this way. Nothing we say, this is last week, nothing we say, nothing we have, and nothing we do, has any value apart from love. That was last week. Do you remember that? Verses one to three. I could speak with the tongues of angels, but if I have not love, I'm nothing more than a clanging gong. I'm like nails on a chalkboard. I could have all prophetic powers, I could have all faith, but if I have not love, Paul writes, I am nothing. And I could do a lifetime of great things like give a ton of money to the Fleming Project. I could give away all of my money. I, I could give myself up to death, martyrdom, even for the sake of Christ, but if I have not love, like a whole lifetime of that. If I have not love, I gain nothing. And so nothing we say, nothing we have, and nothing we do has any value apart from love. That's verses one to three. And if that doesn't make us consider our life's ambitions... I don't know what would. The question we should be asking then is the all-important question of what is love? Because if nothing we say and nothing we do and nothing we have has any value apart from love, then that's the all-important question. We, we need to know what love is. And I'm going to do the best I can to answer that question out of our text by God's grace by highlighting what love is. But I'm also going to highlight what love isn't. And I'm going to end by talking about why love is greatest. So what love is, what love isn't, if you're taking notes, what love is, what love isn't, and why is love greatest. But before going there, one very important thing to note about our text on the front end, and that is love won't be explained with feelings. Shows up nowhere which is very counterintuitive to how we think of love today, right? I went to the dictionary, just looked at a dictionary definition of love, and this is what it says there. You can read it behind me. Love is an intense feeling of deep affection. But you won't find any mention of feeling or affection in 1 Corinthians 13. Not none. In fact, love isn't so much defined in 1 Corinthians 13 as described in 1 Corinthians 13. And Paul de describes it not as something you feel, but as something you do. Now, does that mean that love is devoid of feeling? Well, no. 
But the love of 1 Corinthians 13 doesn't rest on it. And it's not birthed out of it. And therefore, you don't ever fall out of the love of 1 Corinthians 13. What you may fall out of is a commitment to the love of 1 Corinthians 13, because the love that's described in this iconic text that gets read at so many weddings is a matter of the will and the spirit in us. More on that as I wrap things up, but it's not a matter of our feelings and emotions, but I need to give, do some more backfilling to make sure that we understand what's going on because In the English language versus the Greek language, the Greek language has an advantage over the English in its description of love. We essentially have one word to describe all sorts of affections. Same word, love. I love pizza. I love my family, right? And we all know what we mean when we use sort of ideas like that, say things like that. We understand the context. We all know that I love pizza way more than my family, right? You understand that. (laughs) Pizza never talks back. It's great. (laughs) In all seriousness, we understand because we understand context. We get the culture. It rests on that, however. The Greek language, as it pertains to love, rests on verbiage. The Greek language has a number of words to uh, describe (coughs) different types of love. Eros, E-R-O-S, To describe romantic and passionate love, you can hear the word erotic in it. If you want to study eros, love in the Bible, Song of Songs. There's a a whole layout on what erotic love, romantic love is. Phileo is used to describe love for friends and family. Uh, Philos in the Greek is the word for friend. If you've ever been to Philadelphia, You've been to the city of brotherly love. Then there's a third word for love, and that is the word agape. It's it's used to describe the love of choice and commitment. Agape is the love being described in 1 Corinthians 13. Eros is a love that should be reserved for a spouse. Although it is a gift of God that I believe is given to us to move us towards marriage. Phileo is a love for our earthly and our spiritual brothers and sisters, parents, children in Christ. It's it's used at times, however, to describe God's love for his son, Jesus. And then there's agape. Eros may come and go. And you may not have phileo for your enemies, but we... Followers of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, are to agape everyone. Jesus said in his very well-known Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love, agapao, agape, your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who persecute you. That's an action that doesn't rest on feelings. Which makes sense because in our passage, and we'll get there eventually, Paul uses 15 verbs, 15 action words to describe love. Our English Bibles translate some of those words as adjectives, but in Greek, they're all verbs, which means what? At the very least, it means what? It means love acts. Love acts, love manifests, love shows up. It doesn't rest on feelings. It acts in spite of, or maybe the absence of feelings. It manifests when it doesn't feel at all. That's 1 Corinthians 13. And therefore, the real question isn't, what is love? But what does love do? What does it look like? 
One more illustration uh, leading to the text. Uh, ha have you ever sh uh, seen light shot through a prism? We'll put an image on the screen. That's a, a drawing, but that gives you the sense. All you Pink Floyd fans right now are going, that's awesome, right? Dark side of the moon. I, that, that's, that's light being shot in. That's the colors of light coming out, side the, or out the other side. That's our passage. That's our passage. The light is love. The prism is chapter 13. And the various colors are the actions of love described in it. Agape is multicolored. And here's the beauty of chapter 13. And I was talking to some guys after about this. The beauty of this is we're going to see multicolored love show up, described for us. And so as we go through it, what you can ask yourself, what I can ask myself is, where do, where do things shine brighter in my love for others? My family, my friends, my kids, my spouse, my roommate, where does it show up? Because I can say to someone, I love you, but there may be act, aspects of my love for somebody that needs to shine brighter. This will make sense as we go through, but ask yourself as we go through in your CGs this week or on your own, where does this show up? This aspect, this characteristic show up more, less in my life. So let's go to our passage. But before we go there, let me just remind you that agape is something you choose to do or not do. And Midtown, God measures our entire life by it. This is no small thing. So let's go to our passage. How does Paul describe love? The first two ways in verse four, he writes, love is patient, love is kind. Patience speaks of endurance. Uh, it's a word that could be translated as long suffering. Patience is how we react to others regardless. And kindness is what we are to retaliate with regardless. We are to be patient people and attack them back with kindness. Like, for example, praying for those who persecute us. The first, patience, and then kindness. The first, patience is reactive. The second, kindness is proactive. Uh, the wisest person who has ever lived in the history of mankind outside of Christ, Solomon, he writes this in Proverbs 19.11, a person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. That's patience. And that's kindness. That's love. Paul says next in verse four, love does not envy or boast. So we move from here at this part already. We move from what love is to what love isn't. Love doesn't envy others or boast about oneself. Why? Well, because it's not possible to love others while envying what they have and, and who they are. Envy speaks of things like being filled with jealousy and, and covetousness. Envy speaks of rivalry, where you don't see others as friends, brothers, sisters, loved ones. You see them as rivals. You see them as a threat. You see them as an enemy. And to boast is simply to brag, to literally heap praise on yourself. And it's not possible to love others while working hard to make yourself out as being greater than they are. What love isn't continues in what we see next in verse four and the first part of verse five. Love is not arrogant or rude. Arrogance is closely connected to boasting, what we just saw. It, it speaks of being puffed up. So what is the difference between boasting and arrogance? Well, to boast is to tell people how great you are, and arrogance is to believe what you're telling them. That's arrogance, that's boasting, that's boasting, that's arrogance, uh, and neither displays love. Paul writes this in Romans 12, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. 
really important connected to this verse. This is not speaking about our intrinsic value as image bearers of God. We are the very good of his creation because we bear the image of God unlike anything else created. So we're inherently good, valuable in the grand scheme of things. This is talking about the context is the same as our text. It's talking about gifts and platform and success and fruit and applause that can come into the church with our gifts within the body. And that can lead to arrogance and it brings division. And so Paul is saying, look, your gifts are exactly that. They're gifts. It's God's grace. He's the one who gives growth. He's the one who gives platform. Don't become arrogant or puffed up. Have sober judgment about who you are. Because if it's, if it's left unchecked, arrogance can be the result. But what does it mean to be rude? And what does rudeness have to do with love? Well, it, it means more than I'd considered before. I did a deep dive on rudeness this week. What is rudeness? Well, quite literally, if you want a definition, it means to behave dishonorably. To, to disgrace yourself while not considering others. That's rudeness. It, it means to speak in a way. It means to act in a way. It means to dress in a way that is indecent and shameful. It's to do something. It's to say something. It's to applaud something that causes shame and dishonor on you and others. What is the opposite of rudeness? I love the practicality of this. It's saying things like please and thank you. It's holding the door for someone. It's not cutting in line. It's treating your girlfriend like a sister in Christ and your boyfriend like a brother in Christ and sons and daughters and moms and dads and brothers and sisters as co-heirs of Christ. It's being on time for meetings regardless of your position. It's shown in how we drive our cars and our table manners. Our culture calls that courtesy. Paul calls it love. And I have strong conviction over this because that's exactly how Jesus defined love when he told a parable about a good Samaritan who showed his love, love for neighbor, showed his love with practical favors for someone he didn't even know. For that is what love does. Tied to this and next, love doesn't insist on its own way, verse five. This isn't, this is another isn't of love, speaks of self-seeking, Love doesn't consider others' interests or one's interests, excuse me, alone, but the interests of others too, which is exactly what Paul writes in Philippians 2, writing, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Notice what Paul says here. He he doesn't say we should neglect ourselves. We, We have things that we have to take care of in our lives, but neither should we seek our own way to the detriment of others. As someone wrote, love is prepared to give up for others what it's entitled to. Love is prepared to give up for others what it is entitled to. Are you? Am I? Are we prepared to give up for others what we feel entitled to? And I'm not talking merely about cash because for some of us, cash is fairly easy to give up. I'm I'm talking about things like time. I'm talking about comfort. I'm talking about recognition. We feel entitled to our recognition a lot, don't we? I'm talking about honor. I'm talking about titles. I'm I'm talking about our schedules. 
I'm talking about grudges. Don't we sometimes feel entitled to keep our grudges? We'll talk about that more as we continue on. I'm talking about the need to always be right and have the last word. I'm talking about things like that because love doesn't insist on its own way. How you doing with that checklist? You know what I mean? Like, I love you, baby. Well, you're always insisting on in your own way. Yeah, but I'm never rude. I get it. Probably not a true statement, but I get it. How you doing with those colors? When you say to someone, I love you, what are you saying? So Paul continues next in verse five. Love is not irritable or resentful. I like how the NIV actually translates this part of the text when Paul writes, love is not, or it says there, love is not easily angered. In other words, not irritable, not easily angered, and it keeps no records of wrong. So resentful, irritable. To be irritable speaks of having a thin facade, easy to poke and get fired up, where there's anger just beneath the surface and and easily provoked. It's not necessarily wrong to get angry, for not all anger is, is wrong, sinful, but some anger is. But whether it is or not, is, it is never okay to sin while angry. We need to be charcoal, not flash powder. You get the imagery? Slow burn. Slow burn. Remember God's question to Jonah at the end of, of, of that book? Do you... Jonah, do you do well to be angry? And Jonah's response is, yeah, God, right? If you need to know, I do really well to be angry. I do really well. So angry that I want to die. Not the right answer for him or us. None of us do well to be angry over the wrong things. And nor is love resentful. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs. And this is so tied to my previous point, because why are we so easily angered? Well, the answer is because we keep a record of wrongs. Record of wrongs against our spouses, our kids, our parents, our buddies, our neighbor, we keep a lot of records of, of wrongs. We, we dwell on them. We soak in them. They become the very fires that we warm ourselves by. For some people, the wrongs that have been done against them become their very identity. And, and this includes the perceived wrongs of God against us. Let me be, I'll speak very personally on this aspect of love because this is a pandemic in the church today. I, I have known people in the church who literally have kept a record of wrongs, a file of wrongs. I, I know people who have been wronged in the past and anyone down the line who smells at all like those from the past has no chance. There, there is no benefit given no trust given. They live almost looking for any new slight. Now, maybe you've never literally made a record of wrongs, but have you ever blacklisted a person or the position they have in your heart? Have you ever treated a person in your life now with contempt because of something that happened years ago from someone else? Paul says love does not do that. And praise God that God doesn't do that either. Psalm 130, if you, Lord, had kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. Next, love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. 
Now, when Paul says love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, he means that love takes no pleasure in unrighteousness, in injustice, in any wickedness at all. Love never rejoices when people are mistreated, when when evil wins out, or when God is dishonored. But it also means that it doesn't turn a blind eye to wrongdoing. That's not love either. It is never an act of love to affirm what God doesn't. That's not love. Oftentimes it can be cowardice and self-serving. To love is to rejoice with the truth. Verse seven, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Literally, love is always bearing, always believing, always hoping, always enduring. All of these are verbs, action words. Does that mean though, here's the, I think a question maybe some of you want to ask, perhaps. Does that mean though that love has to be sort of willfully naive I mean, the NIV translates hopes all things as always trust. Love always trusts. Really? Always? Couldn't that set us up for getting walked over? Even worse, in certain contexts, abused? So what does this mean? Well, this is how D.A. Carson answers. Love is not to be gullible. Remember, love doesn't rejoice with unrighteousness. It's not to be gullible, but it is to prefer to be generous in its openness and acceptance rather than suspicious and cynical. Love is to be ready to forgive 70 times, seven times. So that's what love is. And that's what love isn't. Let me wrap up with the greatness of love by reading verses 8 to 13. Paul writes, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. This part of the text reminds us that we're in a spiritual gifts series, but what Paul writes here is that a time is coming when the gifts will cease and they will no longer be necessary. Gifts like what? Well, prophecy, gifts like tongues, gifts like knowledge. When is that time? When do gifts cease? Well, Paul tells us when the perfect comes. Now, the cessationists, remember talking about different camps, those who believe that the more miraculous gifts have ceased now, the cessationists, this is a really important text for them because they believe the perfect came when the closing of the canon of Scripture took place, meaning the 66 books here were codified in the fourth century. That's the perfect because they believe that the scriptures are perfect. They're the very words of God. I agree. I I agree that the scriptures are perfect and they are fully sufficient for life and godliness now. That's the promise that we see in them, but they're not all encompassing because even with the giving of the Bible, we don't know all things. And Paul writes that when the perfect comes, we will know fully. The illustration that Paul gives in our text is right now we're like kids in Christ. But a time is coming when the perfect comes when we will be adults and we will fully know 
as we have been fully known. So if the perfect isn't this, and, and believe, I believe this is God's word, but if that's not what it's a reference to, what then is the perfect? Well, I think the answer is found in verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Whose face? <laughs> you know the answer. Jesus' face. Listen, listen to what John wrote in 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. Just look, look at that phrase. What we will be, you and me if you're in Christ, what we will be has not yet appeared. And then he goes on to say, but we know that when he appears, Jesus, who we will be like, for we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is face to face. And, and when that time comes, the gifts will no longer be necessary. As Karl Barth said, when the sun rises, all the lights go out. And the sun has risen. And when he comes again, all the gifts go out. Because the perfect has come. And we shall be like him. Do you, do you know what else ceases when the perfect comes? <clears throat> Besides tongues, prophecy, knowledge, and, and the rest of the gifts. What else ceases is faith and hope. Faith will be replaced with sight. And hope will be replaced with the fullness of God's revelation. But love never ends. Why? Because God is love. God is not hope. He's not hope. He's where our hope rests. And he's not faith. He's where our faith is directed, but he is love. <coughs> Which is why love is eternal and why love is greatest. But for now though, thanks Heather, <clears throat> For now, though, they remain faith, hope, and love, and all three are necessary, but only one stands eternal. As I make a turn for home in this message, it may interest you. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Thanks. No ice, hey? All right, no ice. <laughs> Oh, look at that. So good. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate that. It's, it may interest you as I, as I begin wrapping up to know that there is a, a debate in some circles about this text. And, and the debate is, uh, what love is being described here? Is it describing our love for God? Or is it describing our love towards others? My response is, do we really have a choice but on one hand, it certainly, in context, describes what our love is to be towards others. I mean, that's the whole point of the chapter. This is the more excellent way that the Corinthian church is to treat one another. Don't be puffed up. Don't get all fired up about your gifts and bring division with them because there's a higher way. There's a more excellent way. Those things are going to stop. Love will go forward. Love is the greatest. But I don't... So. That's the context, our love for the body, but I don't think anybody would argue that we shouldn't love God this way too. But we can't. We can't. After all of that, 35 minutes, we can't. We can't love like this. unless two things happen first. One is that an outside agency, an empowerment, enables us to not only love like this, but to want 
to love like this. Because to want to love like this isn't natural. It, it requires a regeneration of the heart. Something has to invade our heart, enabling us, like I said, to, to love like this, but to want to love like this. And we've been given that agency, that empowerment, if you are in Christ, the Holy Spirit. Romans 5, 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, poured into us to not only know that we are loved, but to love God and others as he calls us to love them. The fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Just listen to what the fruit of the Spirit in us is to bear out. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Doesn't that sound like our text? That is our text. I said two things need to take place. That's the first. What's the second? Well, we can't love like this unless we'd been first love like this. And we have. We have. Loved by someone patient and kind. Do you know who God is really patient towards? <laughs> Sinners and saints. He's long-suffering. He, he's patient in a way that you and I can't understand. Literally, he's slow with sinners because he wants none of them to perish. And he's patient with stumbling saints because he never forgets that we're made from dust. Jesus, our great high priest, reacts to our weaknesses with sympathy. And, and Paul writes that God shows his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. His kindness, Paul writes in Romans 2, his kindness is meant to lead to repentance. Do you hear it? In response to our sin, God in Christ retaliated with kindness. Jesus on the cross, persecutors, father. He prayed for him, father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Patience and kindness, because that's what love does. And, and Jesus did not envy or boast, and nor was he arrogant. He was clothed in humility for us. Jesus said at a moment in time, I don't even have a place to lay my head down tonight. And rude? Never. Always compassionate, always gracious, especially with the sick and the harlot, the ostracized, the tax collector, the annoying crowds, the children too. He welcomed them. He invited them. He touched them. Children sat on his lap. Lepers felt the touch of his hand because that's what love does. And he never insisted on his own way. He, he handed off what was rightfully his in cosmic proportion. His will was the will of his father, even if that meant drinking the cup of wrath that his father gave him to drink. Giving up what was rightfully his for the sake of others. Because that's what love does. And, and he was not easily angered, certainly not, Resentful. He did get angry, though, a number of times, but always at the right things because he did not rejoice at wrongdoing because love doesn't do that. 
And if that meant he had to flip over some tables, then he flipped over some tables because sometimes that's the most loving thing to do. But his joy was found more so in the truth because he is the truth. Capital T. He's not true. He's truth. He's that which all other things get compared to and judged by. And that's why love rejoices with the truth. And Midtown not only doesn't, oh, doesn't he keep a record of wrongs. No. Oh, he took our record of wrongs. And in exchange, he wiped our slate clean. You know the only record keeping of Jesus? The only thing Jesus records? Our names <laughs> in the book of life. Our precious, precious Jesus. And in love, he bore all things. Didn't he? Because that's what love does too. The sin of us all was laid on him because love bears all things. And in return, what did he give us? He gave us a light burden and an easy yoke. And finally, Jesus always believed and he had a certain hope. And in, <laughs> and in spite of the shame of the cross, but for the joy set before him, he endured it to the end because love endures all things until it is finished. Because that's what love does. Would you rise as I pray and we go into a time of response? Let me pray for us and then I'll give us some direction. Uh, Jesus, the word is very, very clear that we love because you first loved us. And you loved us this way. Not with mere feelings or emotions, although those are beautiful gifts too. But you loved us in this way. Giving up what was rightfully yours for our sake. Thank you. We bless you. We worship you. And we ask by way of the spirit that you sent to us, those of us who are in Christ, who have the spirit of the living God living in them, I pray for more. I pray that this love that we see here would be something that we grow in more and more. Empower us, enable us, help us to want to love like this and empower us to do so. The greatest apologetic, Jesus, that you gave us is our love for one another. Greater than any expression of any gift, your lo our love for one another, birthed out of our love for you and your love for us. We want to abide in that love, we want to express that love. So please do that in us individually and corporately. May we be a people who loves well here. And as we go from here, uh, Holy Spirit, please do a work in us. Show us those areas of love that need attention. To, to maybe some apologies that need to happen. Maybe some purposeful, purposeful decisions that need to be taken care of, re remedied, followed through on. Maybe we're keeping records of wrongs. Maybe we, we do envy. Maybe we do boast. Maybe we are rude. Who amongst us isn't, at least at times? So help us as we go forward. Sanctify us. Work in us. Cut away that sin that so easily entangles. For the sake, the sake of your name and glory. There's so much hate in the world today. We want to be people of love. And rejoice in the truth. You are the truth. So I pray for this. Thank you for this. In Jesus' great name, amen.